All right, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Jim Egan was a professional photographer in Providence, Rhode Island for 40 years. In his spare time, he became fascinated with the Newport Tower. And to make a long story short, he wrote the book on it and opened a museum. <laughs> so he is the resident expert. He was, um, uh, for many years, he was a uh, near estate coordinator for Rhode Island. And so he's well known to many of us here. He's given many interesting talks on the Newport Tower and other topics over the years. So. Today he's going to explain to us exactly why the Newport Tower is not an old windmill. Please welcome Jim Egan. Nero Romance. So let's have a hand for them. You know, Diane spells her name with a Y in it, which is kind of unusual, but Shakespeare in Sonnet 153 of Shakespeare's Sonnets, he uh, uses the word Diana and he uses it with the letter Y. Now, Diana was the goddess of the hunt. She was the fairest goddess of all of the, uh, 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 the, uh, the nymphs of the forest. Uh, but I wanted to acknowledge that there was another great goddess here in the room today that we, should that we should talk to. This is Athena, and this is a statue of the great goddess Athena. She was the number one patron of Athens, and uh, there is a replica. This is a replica of the statue that once stood in the Parthenon. It was 60 feet tall and it was all painted with, with, uh, with gold and red and all sorts of colors on it. And she was uh, celebrated as the patron saint and that's what they named Athens after. Well, uh, what you'll see on the walls here are, are the front and the back of the Parthenon, these architectural features. In the way back on the left is a, what's called a circular temple, which I'll be showing some circular temples today. But what I really wanted to show today was you see, if you have the queen over here, why is nothing over here? Well, do you know what this is? This, uh, this is, has uh, several facades to it. One, two, three. Anyone tell me what it is? This is a replica of the Tower of the Winds in Athens, Greece, which is an eight-sided octagonal, octagonal horologium. Horologium means a building that keeps track of time. And up at the top in the frieze, you'll see uh, these are the, the eight winds, the west, the east, the northeast, and the west. Now, you're only three and seeing three of the sides here. It's actually an octagonal building, and the entrance looks exactly like this. It was built in 75 BC, still standing today in Athens, Greece. I visited it myself. And what I'm going to talk today about is a horologium, basically the same type of a building, only uh, a little bit later in, in, in time. So, uh, so let me go back to the beginning here. I guess I've been clicking while I'm doing it. So what I want to talk to you today is about the OSL proposal to do testing at the Newport Tower. Well, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. Spoiler alert is that they vetoed it. <laughs> we, we, we wanted to make this presentation to the city of Newport to allow us to do OSL testing at the tower. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, when we went to present it to the city, they said it's too long. Can you cut it down to 20 minutes? Because it's about an hour. Hey, can you cut it down to 20? So I cut it down to 20. And they said, mm, we have maybe 10. I said, I cut it down to 10. And they said, you know, we can only give you five minutes. I said, OK. I cut the heck out of the thing. And we got to, the, to make the presentation. They said, sorry, the Newport Historical Society has vetoed any uh, archaeological digging at the tower. You can't do anything. Uh, and, and, and that was the end of it. 
So I said, well, I've got this beautiful presentation. I'd practice it, and I'm like, well, I'll just share it with Nira. They'll listen to anything. <laughs> so I decided to, 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 uh, to share it with you. This is uh, Newport in the spring. It's a lovely place. I want to tell a quick story first. Uh, 40 years ago uh, in the 70s, my wife and I bought a, uh, a 1726 house in western Rhode Island, a really old house. And uh, my friend, my wife wanted to know if there were any ghosts in it. So she had a friend who knew a psychic named Powhatan. And, and, and Powhatan came out to the house to check for spirits. And she went to all the fireplaces and the girths. And he said, no, it's, it's only good stuff. Don't worry about it. And so I said, you know, since we got a little time, my neighbor has this chamber on his property. And I had never seen stone chambers before. Could we take a look? And so we saw it. And she crawled inside. It was one of the small ones. We only could get one or two people in it. And she says, uh, I don't know. It kind of feels Celtic to me, but I don't really know about such things. But you know who you should talk to is uh, uh, my friend Gandalf in Ohio. <laughs> and he studies uh, the, the stone rings out there. I'm like, Gandalf? She goes, yeah, here's his number. So, so I call Gandalf, and he's like, you know, I mostly study Ohio stuff, Midwestern things. Um, but I just got this newsletter in the mail yesterday from N-E-A-R-A. So in 1980, I joined NERA, and since then, I've met the most amazing uh, people and seen the most amazing things that other people in New England never get to see. So uh, my, my friend, actually, uh, uh, he calls me uh, New England Antiquities Research Devotee, but lately he's just been using the acronym NERD. <laughs> So the other thing I wanted to warn you about is uh, I'm retired now, and a couple, of, a couple of years ago I took up singing and tap dancing lessons. So if I break into, uh, into dance, it's because I can't help it. <laughs> so uh, so uh, one of the weirdest stone structures in all of New England is in my home state, uh, the Newport Tower. And uh, the three things I want to talk to you today about, historians have different ideas about the tower. They, uh, it's very important in Rhode Island history, and modern science is useful for explaining it. And then I wanted to explain who I was and what NERA is. I was a professional photographer for 40 years in Providence, Rhode Island. Took pictures of people, products, places for ad agencies, design studios, and um, and uh, and the strangest building, as I said, was was this was this tower. Uh, so as I, I joined NERA, and I'm very proud of NERA's mission statement, which is very, you should read it slowly, but, you know, nonprofit organization 64 dedicate understanding of study and preservation of sites in their cultural context. Those last two words are very important because without the cultural context, you're just guessing at things. So uh, here is the tower underneath each of these pillars is three and a half tons of stone, each pillar, three and a half tons of stone that goes four feet down to bedrock, eight symmetrical pillars, beautiful arches, and, 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 then, and, and then three windows in the top. Now, my work is based, they've been talking about the Newport Tower since 1964 when NERA started. Um, but in the, uh, in the uh, 1990s, Professor William Penhollow, who was a NERA member, he, uh, he and James Mavor uh, went to the tower to do some measurements one day, and they brought his son along, uh, Penhollow's son. And they had a ladder, they allowed him to go up, and, and the Penhollow's son was sitting in one of the windows, and he says, hey, Dad, you know, from here, here I can see right through the south window. So Penhollow goes around to the outside of the tower in the park and he looks through and he goes, hey look, you can see right through this tower. It was that window and this window here. This is a cross section, cross section of the first floor room. And so Penhollow analyzed it and then he wrote a, uh, uh, a 12 page dissertation on it, presented it in front of the American Astronomical Society in Chicago and it was very well received but they all said, Rhode Island? Who gives a shit about Rhode Island? <laughs> but he was in some building in Rhode Island. In other words, there was very little national enthusiasm about it. It kind of frustrated Penn Hollow. But, but uh, here he's using his astrolabe. And, and you'll see that uh, this is a fireplace in this region right here. This is what we call the northeast window, the south window, the west window. There are several small uh, peepholes in the top, as well as several niches in here. And he determined the exact angles of it and then, and then linked it up with the sun, moon, to, to decide these things. And, and he made these calculations. He says, on December 21st, the winter solstice, the sun uh, will arise above the horizon about half an hour after sunrise and shine right through the south window, through the tower, and through the west window, and you can observe it from the northeast corner of the park. This is a picture of it. Uh, I've seen it many years. Uh, three years ago, we had uh, 150 people came uh, to, to visit it. And um, uh, 
And then after this event happens at 7 o'clock, there's another event where the light shining through the south window projects onto an egg-shaped rock. You can't see it in this picture on the interior, and everybody waits around for that. And it's like, everyone's like, oh, I'm going to be there. I'll be there next winter. Well, I don't realize you've got to freeze your butt off to get there. It's kind of cold. It's in the morning. But uh, here are my pictures from the last 10 years. It happens every year, and, and I always go to, to witness it. And it's always kind of the same. It's a perennial sort of thing. The second alignment Penn Hollow came up with was the moon alignment. He says, one day out of every 18.6 years, and that day is December 26, 1996, you'll be able to see the moon through these two windows, the west window and the northeast window. So I went there on that night, and uh, sure enough, uh, th there's the moon. In, 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 it's not just the moon, it's the full moon on that day. And uh, it filled up, I'm looking through one window, right through the tower, through the second window. This, by the way, anyone recognize this? <laughs> That's Dougie Schwartz. <laughs> it was hard to remember. But, but, uh, but he, he and I went there to test uh, Ben Hollow's thesis. And then he said it would happen 18.6 years later. And it did. It happened in uh, uh, 1996, uh, where you got the event. And he said it won't happen again until 2033. And so uh, we're going forward here. Uh, there's also an equinox event that happens every year on March 21st and September 21st where the sun shining through a small hole on the second floor comes through the northeast window and you can observe it for about a half an hour. Uh, it happens around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, only lasts for half an hour, and then whoosh, done, only on the equinox. So Penhollow said the person who designed this tower really, really knew their astronomy. The chances are about 1 in 10,000 that these are random. So uh, since then, I've written uh, uh, over a dozen books on the tower and opened up the M Newport Tower Museum where I explain the various things about I, what I found. This is a replica of the first governor's chair. And, and it's uh, 50 steps northeast of the tower on Mill Street in Newport. And, uh, and presently, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to expand it. I'm going to be moving into this section here, not because it's so successful, but just because uh, I want to have a little more room on it. And, uh, and I own the building. so. <laughs> uh, so this uh, is my guest list. I've had people in the last 10 years from all over the world, every country in Europe, every state in the Union. I had a guy from the Galapagos came and signed. They were from all over. But nobody from Rhode Island ever comes, <laughs> except nearer people. And people from Newport, no, no. My grandmother told me it was built by the Vikings. You kind of tell me you've been here for 10 years. You can tell me what the um, Anyways, don't get started. I let everybody have their own idea about the tower. Uh, that's what is so beautiful about it. So the five theories, the six main theories are uh, the Vikings in 1150. And they, uh, um, uh, they, they claim that they, they came here uh, uh, from, from part of the settlements uh, that, uh, from up in Canada and, and built this as, uh, as sort of, as sort of a, a round church. And uh, uh, this fellow by the, by the name of Charles Christian Raffin, he was the first guy to talk about this in, in 1853. He was a Scandinavian, and he had only seen pictures of the tower. And, uh, and he said, oh, yeah, that's clearly a Viking tower. He'd never seen the tower, by the way. And, and then Wadsworth Longfellow, Henry, he wrote a poem about it called Skeleton and Armor, uh, about the, the Viking that came across and built this for his wife. And then uh, since then, it's gotten into the, uh, into the cultural milieu, the Hotel Viking, the Viking Cleaners, like our football team is the Vikings. And so um, it's part of, it's part of mystic. Vikings are sexy, okay, right? But also, if you want sexy, uh, another thing that's sexy, oh, by the way, uh, last year, Peter Storm Mary, he came here and, and they, they filmed this, uh, this uh, documentary for television called The Vikings in America. You can go to, uh, to, uh, to Google it on YouTube. Um, but um, this guy, Peter Storm Mary, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he was the wood chipper in Fargo, and he was uh, the head nihilist in The Big Lebowski. Bad man. <laughs> Anyways, he plays all the villains. But we had a fun time, and uh, I got him to dress up like a, <laughs> like a Viking with the two head buildings on. We had a lot of fun. The other sexy idea is that it was built by the Templars in 1398. Now, the Templars, is that sexy or what? They claim that uh, Prince Henry Sinclair sent a voyage over here in 1398 and built this as a, as, um, as a, as a Templar church. 
Um, but um, my question is, you know, they were disbanded in 1307, and so that's like a century. I'm like, well, that's four generations. Who, who are these guys marrying, and who are you guys, you know, give me some names. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's a very popular thing, and it was on a TV show called uh, uh, America's Oldest Secret. And uh, 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 over a million people have viewed this on television. Scott Walter had me on the show, which I appreciate. And he, you know, he's the Templar guy. And I said, you know, no, how about my theory? And I started talking about my theory. So we debated back and forth. It's a nice, lively uh, discussion. And he had a great show on History Channel. And this is one of the most popular uh, viewed and reviewed. The other theory is by Gavin Menzies that it was built by the Chinese in 1421. They came around the coast of Africa in these huge ships and built this tower to be, uh, to be uh, the, the new China in 1421. And, uh, uh, and he says that there's, uh, there's rice in the mortar. Well, they've never tested the mortar. There's no rice in the mortar. But they had a BBC special, and they asked Professor Penhollow and me to be on the special. So uh, we arrived there, and they had three cameras. They were all on us. And, and all of a sudden, Gavin Menzies comes walking up a little bit late. And, and Penhollow asked some question about things that he had quoted Penhollow in his book. And he says, just give me a minute. I've never seen the tower before. I've <laughs> never seen the tower before. Come on, Gavin, let's go. And then every time we asked him a question, he would say, I'll get back to you on it. I'll get back to you on it. I'll get back to you on it. So he didn't really have much of a clue. He'd never seen the thing. And then the Portuguese in 1501, uh, it's claimed that the, um, the first, uh, that Miguel Cortorial, who got shipwrecked, he, uh, um, he somehow made it to land with a bunch of men and all of his tools and built this while he was waiting for his brother, Miguel, to, to rescue him. Um, but uh, 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 it, but uh, the point is, uh, this was uh, posited by a fellow by the name of Lu Manuel da Silva, who was a NERA member, and he spoke about the tower for many times, and I always loved uh, he hearing him talk about it. Uh, and he, he wrote also about uh, what's called the, the Dighton Rock, and he was very well known, especially in his hometown in Portugal. They have since made a museum out of his house, and uh, they uh, made this whole library for all of his library works. And in town, there, is, uh, there used to be a hotel that was named the Newport Tower because of all of the Newport Tower thing that he, he was into. Uh, but again, I let everybody have their own theories. The main theory, the people in Newport, the Historical Society, will tell you that it was a colonial will, windmill built by the first governor of Rhode Island in the 1660s. You'll see that it's on uh, this plaque that's on the tower, 1660, first period vernacular, windows, blah, blah, blah. And, and, uh, and uh, we're going forward here. And uh, let's see, uh, here is, is a big stone in the tower. They've got it engraved on that in the, in the park. And that's what they're standing by because that was the theory 100 years ago. <laughs> we shouldn't change. It was good enough for that director. It could be good enough for me. Good. So, so they keep the same thing. Well, one day I was in the park because I, uh, I give lectures to anyone I think that's interesting. And, and there were 30 people gathered around there. And I'm like, what's going on? They said, we're structural engineers. We're having a convention at the Hotel Viking around the corner. And we, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we want to know who built this building. And I said, well, that plaque over there, the Historical Society, will tell you that it was built in the uh, 1660s uh, as, a, uh, as a windmill. They all started laughing. I'm like, Hey, what's so funny? We let everybody have their own idea in this place. We're fair about it. And I said, what's so funny? They said, Jim, a windmill has blades that go from the top. There's a turret on the top, because that has to face the wind continuously, turn. And so the blade goes all the way to the ground. There's one twice as high, and then the arms go out twice as high on, on the side there. If the wind's blowing right at it, that's fine. You get some resistance. But the minute the wind shifts, which it does all the time in Newport, you get what they call torque, rotational twist. And they said the upper cylinder would twist right off, and those pillars would fall like a row of do dominoes. Boom, 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 boom. And they said the other thing is that these are what they call static connections. They're, they're not, there's no rebar in there, bro. It's just rocks on top of rocks with a little mortar inside. It's like a peanut butter jelly sandwich, and that is not structural. It's like a weld. Once it breaks, boom, it's gone. And you get one break, and then it's all break. They said, if that was a windmill, it wouldn't be standing. 
I'm like, whoa, well, that's certainly a good argument about the windmill. And then they said, uh, also, you don't have an open arcade on a windmill because that's where the grindstones are and all your grain would blow away. And they said, you don't have a fireplace in a windmill because flour powder is more explosive than gunpowder. The whole thing would blow up. This is a fireplace that has two flues on it. And, uh, and it, it's in the first floor room of the tower. Plus, uh, all t windmills taper to the top because the, otherwise the turret has to be huge. And so this, t this, this is a typical one. This one's in Eastham uh, in, on Cape Cod. But this doesn't taper. So you'd have to have a 24-foot turret, big wooden thing or something made out of metal. How are you going to move that around? You know, these, they can move them around with sticks from the back or ropes. Anyway, the question is, who was the first governor of Rhode Island? And I don't want anyone to tell me because uh, I'm going to um, remember. These guys were British. We're talking British here. You know, well, these weren't Americans. We didn't have the, re you know, we didn't have the revolution until the 1700s. But um, the first governor of Rhode Island, uh, he was uh, appointed by King Charles to be the first governor of Rhode Island, re-elected seven times. When he died, a thousand people attended his funeral. He was the first person to arrive in Rhode Island, and, uh, and he signed the original deed for Providence, and he's been thrown out of the history books. Gone! You'll barely read his name. Maybe a little footnote on the bottom of it. That's because his name was Benedict Arnold. No, not the traitor. This is the great, great, great grandfather of the traitor. The first governor, he used Benedict I, and then his son, his son, his son, and Benedict V. They live 100 years apart. Nothing to do with each other. You want to get blamed for something your great grandson does? So, um, uh, uh, what I did was I dug into history. I went to the Rhode Island Historical Society, the Brown University Archives. I went to every historical society in, uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, to dig deep for him. And then I, mostly I found some articles that were written about him, but very little, and just stuff in the archives. But what I found was that he arrived in Providence in 1635, and um, this is uh, April of 1635, two months before Roger Williams even arrived. These guys were here first. You see, Roger Williams had been kicked out, and all of his friends had been kicked out of Boston for their religious beliefs. But the Arnolds, they came right over from England, and they're like, we're going to make some money on this place. Look at this beautiful bay, Narragansett Bay, and nobody's here, and, and, uh, and trading with the, the Indians. So um, uh, he was uh, here with his father, uh, 48 years old, which means he was born in Elizabethan times, because this is uh, the, the 1530s, 1630s. And then uh, Benedict and his, his, uh, his cousin, Thomas Hopkins, and then his sister is getting remarried. So it was like the whole family came over at, at once, and uh, he signed in 1636, signed the original deed for, for, uh, for, for to Providence. Here is Benedict Arnold's signature here, Benedict Arnold. Here is Roger Williams, a little hard to read. And so he became uh, the wealthiest man in, uh, in, in, in the colony. Uh, he paid more taxes by far than anybody else paid. Because he was a merchant and he was able to do the, the sales deals. I said he became president of the colony before it became a state for four terms. And he would, they would have had him more, but he's like, look, you got to give a little bit to this other guy. <laughs> and then he was appointed by King Charles I to be the first governor of Rhode Island, 1663, reelected seven times. And as I said, when he died, a thousand people attended his funeral. So, uh, uh, Let's see. Uh, while he was the governor, he allowed the, the Jews, the, the Quakers, the Sabbatarians, all of these splinter groups to come to Newport. Everybody was welcome. This was freedom of speech, freedom of religion. You couldn't do that in Massachusetts. You couldn't do that in Connecticut or even up and down the coast. And so all of these groups came here and helped the, the whole mercantile system, the money system, the working system. And, um, and, and so in, in, uh, 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 the, the, the people of Boston wrote this letter down. They said, hey, look. You can have the Jews and the Sabbatarians, but no Quakers. They don't like the Quakers at all. Quakers back then were a little more rabble-rousers than the Quakers today, which are very kind of nice and, and calm. Um, uh, but he, he, uh, he wrote back, Benedict Arnold, this is his letter. We have no law among us whereby we punish any for declaring by works, by words, their minds and understanding concerning the way, things and ways of God as to salvation and eternal condition. This is the First Amendment written 100 years before the First Amendment was written. And, uh, and so uh, this is his first uh, official seal as governor, B.A., Benedict Arnold, his initials, and the anchor of hope, which is the state symbol still today. 
and uh, he, uh, they found this ring uh, at a burial of, for an Indian sagamore, and they believed that it was given by Benedict Arnold, and it shows the anchor of hope, the symbol of Rhode Island with a heart. Uh, love to the Indians. I thought that was a beautiful gesture, just the meaning of that. And his uh, chair that he had when he was first governor is still in existence. It's at the Redwood Library. And uh, 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 it, it was what they call a wainscot chair. So this is basically Rhode Island's first throne. This is a, a throne of, 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 uh, of Rhode Island here. Let's see. Oh, I think I hit the wrong button here. Oh, I see. There's a button underneath the button. <laughs> All right. Oh, he knows how to get rid of it. There we say it. It's huge. I attended his funeral. Uh, this is not an actual photo. This is my drawing, by the way, guys. <laughs> I, hey, the, the photo was a little blurry. I had to Photoshop it. A anyway, this is his grave, which is right down the street from the tower. And look, they stole the plaques in the 40s or something. They'd never been replaced. We don't want to talk about Benedict Arnold because everybody knows that means traitor. Well... Get over it, bro. This is history. You've got to go by what it is, not what you feel about the whole thing. And so, uh, as I say, he's been thrown out of history. Right on. Yeah, a little clap for that. So one day I was in the library and looking up Benedict Arnold stuff, and I came across this book uh, that was written in 1956 called Newport Begins by, uh, by Lloyd Robson. And uh, it says historical names for Narragansett Bay. Now, Verrazano had been here in 1525. His brother drew a map. A map in which he called this bay, Narragansett Bay, Refugio. He says it's the best bay on the East Coast. It could be a refuge for an entire navy. And, uh, and then um, uh, Maggiolo drew a map first, and then Verrazano's brother. They both called it Refugio, and then the Spanish called it the Bay of Santa Baptista. And then I saw this, the John D. Bay and River, 1583. Wait a minute. That's 40 years before the pilgrims. Why would this bay be named after an Englishman? And so uh, I started studying about this guy, John D., and, and w what this deed really meant. So I, when I dug into it, I found this deed uh, that uh, was printed in the uh, uh, Rhode Island Historical Society <laughs> collections. The Rhode Island Historic published this in 1934. Uh, a fellow by the name of William Goodwin, who you're probably familiar with, who wrote uh, uh, the, the, the old caves of, of the Irish in New England and was responsible for starting up Stone, uh, America's Stonehenge. He went to London, and he's like, I'm going to study a little more. And he went to the, the, uh, Liz, uh, the, um, the British Records Office and studied Elizabethan uh, 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 records, and he found this deed, and he reported about it in 1933. This is the printing from it. Between Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who had been deeded all of North America, and Sir George Peckham, who was the financier of this project. And it was acknowledged even by the queen herself. This is no, like, you know, <laughs> mean deed. Uh, she did it. And so uh, I'm like, well, what is going on? Well, the deed said that uh, Sir Humphrey Gilbert deeds to Sir George Peckham all that river report called by Master John D. the D River, which, by the description of Verrazano, lies about 42 degrees latitude with its mount. So 42 degrees, is, uh, that's the latitude of, of Newport, by the way, here. And, and he tells us he's in Verrazano's description. Uh, mouth open to the south a half a mile wide, uh, one mile wide, and then it goes northeast for 24 uh, miles, and then it makes a bay 40 leagues in circumference in which there are five small islands. Perfect description of Narragansett Bay. Uh, it's been known since 1934, as I said. Verrazano, his, uh, uh, his, his brother, drew this, this map uh, 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 from Verrazano's report, from his brother's report, because he didn't actually come here. But here is Port de Refuge. He, he, na he, he names it, and this is the triangular island, uh, uh, now called Block Island, about the size of the Isle of Rhodes, he called it, that points to the mouth of the bay. And, and, and so uh, uh, this is uh, 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 another map that was done by uh, Gastaldi, and here he, she, he actually makes the island triangular. He's like, well, he said it was a triangle. I'll make a triangle pointing to the mouth of the bay here. And so um, these are pretty, pretty clear references. And the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Elizabethans knew all about Verrazano's report. It was well circulated around England. So in these, uh, the two greatest authorities on uh, Elizabethan exploration are David Beers Quinn and Samuel Elliott Morrison. They both say in the book, Narragansett Play was the site of this huge colonization effort. So I'm like, Okay, let's see. Huge colonization effort by the people whose language we speak and a building nobody knows who built. 
Hey, maybe this has something to do with each other. Duh. <laughs> yeah, so the reason that, the, Span that the, the English wanted to have a settlement in New England was because Spain was becoming a superpower. They had all the gold from Mexico, the silver from Peru, and the galleons were going back and forth trading, and they were becoming a superpower. And they, so, uh, so, uh, so England was about to sort of de be demolished. So it was an idea of, of Spain versus England, and they, it later became what's called the Spanish Armada. I'm sorry, I keep pressing this wrong button here. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so what I wanted to show you was that the guy who was responsible for all of this stuff, um, he uh, is in the silver box. John D is here with us today. <laughs> the Elizabethans, I claim, were the ones that actually built this tower in 1583. So, <laughs> so the way this goes here, uh, this guy, John D, uh, uh, you'll probably be familiar with, with uh, some of the people that he inspired throughout literature. He is um, the character called Prospero in The Tempest, the guy with all the books and does all of the magic and such. He is also the uh, uh, Dumbledore in the Harry Potter series, the guy with the long beard that does the magic and has all the books. And in this series called The Lord of the Rings, he is who? Gandalf. Gandalf led me to Gandalf. What up with that? <laughs> I can't believe it. So this guy, John Dee, he had the largest library in England, a library of 4,000 books, and he was an advisor to the Queen. And in 1577, he wrote these uh, series of uh, eight books to Queen Elizabeth, uh, and uh, in, in it, this is the front cover called, whoops, General and Rare Memorials uh, to the Perfect Art of Navigation. And here is the Queen guiding Queen Elizabeth, it's even labeled Elizabeth, guiding the ship of state to the new world. The five ships have come down. And they started a settlement. The English are pleading. Uh, Send, uh, estolos es plus modus menos, totes es florion florion, which means send forth a sailing expedition to build a steadfast watch post. They're on their knees. And this is the, uh, they said, uh, uh, he said, this is the moment, this is lady occasion and uh, lady luck. If you take this, seize the moment, all this good stuff will happen. But if you don't, danger lurks, the skull, boom. <laughs> so in the books, Dee says, look, Elizabeth, you already have a legal right to all of North America because earlier Englishmen had, had claimed it, like King Arthur and Prince Maddox, John Sebastian Cabot. And, uh, and he says, we need to build a navy of 6,000 uh, men and, and build 60 to 80 large ships. And he coins the term, the British Empire, coins the term. He was the guy that came up with it and said she needed to trade with China and Japan by going through the Northeast and Northwest patches. The main proponent of it. And so uh, this is, there, here's the queen herself, one of her early years here, ER. And she, uh, let's see, we're going forward here. We're going forward. We're going forward. Okay. So a month after she receives all of this stuff from John D, she deeds all of North America to this guy, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, one of her bravest courtiers in the war in Ireland. And he gets the grant on the summer solstice of 1638. Remember that date, summer solstice of 1678, excuse me, 1678. And, um, and he was an army general, and he put together this whole mission to come over here. Uh, they, they, they sent over preliminary expedition in, in 1580, and then uh, another expedition in 1582, and then he came over in 1583, which I'll explain. But he was so appreciative of the work that John D. did, he gives John D. all the lands north of the 50 degree line. That's all of Alaska, Canada, and Greenland went to D. Gilbert got all the rest except for Florida and the Caribbean where the Spanish were. The two boys split up North America. Talk about guts, huh? Let's just take a continent and give it to, give it to ourselves. And Gilbert was not disappointed, even though you might say, well, he got the cold area. He wanted the passage to China and get all the taxation on that. And so 
These guys asked for the thing, and they got it. <laughs> this is John Dee's map of 1582. It's called a circumpolar map in which uh, you can see uh, the, the North Pole. This is the prime meridian that used to go through uh, San Miguel. Here is Great Britain, France, Spain. And here is the coast of America. And he even has Block Island labeled. Block Island is tiny, <laughs> but it was a very meaningful place. Uh, Verrazano called it Claudia in this, in this particular uh, map. This is John Dee's map of 1580 of just the, of the coast. And you see very clearly that he has marked the triangular island at the mouth of the bay. Uh, Narragansett Bay and Block Island. <laughs> and so uh, what happened in, it was first in, 15, in, 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 in 1580, they sent over uh, Simon Fernandes, who was a, a Portuguese uh, sailor. And he came over and returned with maps. He drew maps of it for them. So they knew where they were going to go. And he came over and returned in 60 days. Took the pilgrims 102 days to get one way. 60, he came over, he was amazing. He knew, he knew the seas and, and play the currents. Then in 1582, they sent over a mission to reconnoiter the place where they can land next year. This is written about this particular mission. And it was led by Anthony Brigham. And I claim they came here and built this tower to be the city center of this first Elizabethan colony. They had two ships and a pinnace, a small boat that could be rowed to shore. And I claim they came here, and their job was to build this tower. Why? Because the deed, to know, the deed had to, said you had to build a building and occupy it for a year before you had legal right in, in the eyes of all the other countries in Europe. In other words, European countries couldn't just say, hey, we own that. That's our stuff. No, you had to have a place and occupy it for years. So these guys sent, were sent over early so that when Sir Humphrey arrived, that they would, uh, they would automatically own the place. But Sir Humphrey never arrived, so they returned. This is what I claim the building originally looked like. Uh, this was the, the first floor, uh, the, the pillars, the first floor. And there's evidence of a stairway going up to the second floor. It's still there. And then I claim that there was actually a third floor, and it, the whole thing was surmounted with a dome. Uh, it only comes up to about here right now. And, and, but you'll see how perfectly, uh, this thing gets a little crazy here. Uh, well, <clears throat> OK, well, what happened in 1583? Sir Humphrey Gilbert comes across with five ships and 80 men. One day out, the Bark Raleigh got a contagious disease. They had to head back home. The other four ships made as far as St. John's in Newfoundland. More people got sick, so they sent the Swallow home, this one here. And then these three ships headed down the coast and off the coast of Nova Scotia, right near Sable Island, they hit a tempest, right? North Atlantic in the, in the, in the fall. And, um, and the delight hit a, hit a sandbar and got crushed to pieces. They had lost all of their supplies for the, for the, to winter over. So the two small ships decided to head back to England and off the coast of the Azores. So Humphrey Gilby, Gilbert in this small 10-man ship gets swallowed by a huge wave and he drowns. The deed to North America becomes void. The colony becomes void. Now, here he is. He's very famous up in Canada. I went to St. John's. And, and look, he shows stamps, his arrival in, 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 in this beautiful harbor, which I, I, I recommend visiting. It's a beautiful place. He's on stamps with the Sir Humphrey Gilbert stamp, the whole thing. Uh, and they have statues of him. And on Water Street, right downtown, is this plaque. And the plaque says, right at this spot in 1583, Sir Humphrey Gilbert took possession of this newfound land for, thereby, for Queen Elizabeth, thereby founding Britain's overseas empire. The beginning of the British Empire. He stayed there for two weeks to pick up some burgers. This is where he was headed, Newport and, and, and Quidnick Island and, and, and Narragansett Bay. But uh, because he made it there, they, he's very famous. And of course, Canada is still British. <laughs> We're not anymore. And so <laughs> uh, the deed became void when he was, when, and because the deed was void, a year later the Queen deeded all of North America to Sir Humphrey Gilbert's younger half-brother, who was Sir Walter Raleigh who made expeditions to Roanoke Island, 1584, 5, and 7. And that was his younger brother. These guys grew up together. They had a different last name because his, his mother had gotten remarried. Uh, but uh, nobody ex makes this connection. And, and you know, you got, uh, you got uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, Raleigh cigarettes, Raleigh, 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 Raleigh. But nobody's ever heard of this guy because he didn't make it past Maine. And if you don't make it to past Maine, it doesn't matter because we're Americans. We only have our interest in our own history. But he's very famous in world Canadian history. Sorry, I didn't mean to be a douse in there. Uh, uh, but I claim the building got built, and, and, uh, and then it got abandoned. And nobody realized exactly who it was until me. <laughs> can you believe that? Can you believe that? Some schmuck like me can figure this all out. 
Why? I'm an interdisciplinarian. I see all these different clues and piece them all together, whereas a lot of people are kind of more specialized. So um, this guy, Sidney Ryder, uh, one of the great historians in Rhode Island, he wrote a book called The Origin of the Name Rhode Island. And he, he, uh, he says that uh, uh, the settlers here must have been familiar with this book by Richard Hackloyd called Diverse Voyages Touching Upon the Discovery of America. It was published in 1582 and republished several times as late as 1600. Well, in um, uh, 1582, this was like the tour guide to North America. Anyone who wanted to come here, they would, tap, they would get this book. And so uh, they were all familiar with it. And in the book, he makes, uh, 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 Hackloyd makes a translation of Verrazano's report from the French uh, actually, he wrote in Italian, and then it was translated into French and, and into English. And he, uh, he says right there uh, on the top line, uh, the island of Rhodes. He talks about uh, Block Island as the island of Rhodes. And, um, and he says, we went from there to this bay just north of it, excuse me, 15 leagues north. And... Um, we entered the bay, and, and the boats, oh, we spent two weeks there. People were very friendly. And he says, the country of Sir H.G. Voyage. He tells, anybody reading the book would know Sir Humphrey Gilbert. This is the place where he went. Very well described. So they knew all about it. So uh, uh, they claim that this is where the name Rhode Island came from. So it came from Verrazano, but the, uh, the uh, uh, Elizabethans uh, adopted it as the secret code name for their mission. And... Uh, uh, and then the early settlers of Rhode Island uh, picked it up. Well, which early settlers uh, came up with the idea of it? Well, it turns out there was a huge expedition uh, that was sent from Boston, uh, the Hutchinson Expedition, and Hutchinson and William Coddington and Clark. They came to Rhode Island in 1638. But Roger Williams writes a letter in 1637. He says that it's called by this Rhode Island. So these guys didn't obviously do it. Uh, but... Um, uh, so uh, Roger Williams writes another letter in 1638 in which he tells, uh, John, this is to John Winthrop Sr., the governor of Massachusetts. They corresponded, uh, even, though, <laughs> even though Winthrop had kicked his ass out of town. He said, get out of here, we're banishing you. But they were still good friends uh, because they had to uh, correspond. And, and, and so Williams writes, sir, concerning the islands of Prudence and the Quidnick, Patmos, if some had not hindered. In other words, uh, Roger Williams wanted to name a Quidnick Island, which is the island where Newport is on. Uh, he wanted to name it Patmos, which is the island in the Aegean Sea where St. John wrote the book of Revelation. He was a religious freak and a Bible freak. And he says, but other people wanted it to be called Rhodes. Well, who were those other people? That was William and Benedict Arnold. And why? Because they knew all about the earlier expedition. They knew about the tower. And they, he was the one who claimed the tower, this guy Benedict Arnold, the first governor of Rhode Island. Why did he use the tower? Well, he became the main trading factor between the Narragansett Indians and the people of Boston. There was a, 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 people, a, a, there was a, a Boston trader uh, named uh, John Oldham, and he was sailing one day uh, a, a little earlier off the coast of Block Island, and uh, Indians invaded his ship and, uh, and killed him. And another British ship came over and said, hey, what's going on here? And they chased all the Indians off, and they're like, you killed him. That was one of the things that precipitated the Pequot War. Well, nobody was doing the trade trope, so the, so the, the Arnolds picked up the trade route, and they tra traded all the furs, the corn, the wampum from the Narragansett. It's the largest tribe in New England, and they had a three-day trading route. One day would go to Newport, the other day to Nantucket, and then around Cape Cod to Boston, three days back, they had these, a fleet of shallops. These were small boats that could ply the shore, stay on the shore. And, and they brought back English cloth, tools, guns, ammunition, this was the only supplies for people in Providence and everything because they couldn't go to Boston even if they wanted to. They'd all been banished. So he became fabulously wealthy, and uh, he knew who built the tower, and he, and he knew that it was built by the Elizabethans. Uh, I've given uh, three talks, uh, several talks on this. I even give a TED talk on this at the stage of the Jane Pickens Theater in, uh, in, in, in Newport, and I've been the subject of a magazine. This is Newport Life magazine, the biggest magazine in Newport. I was so psyched to get in there. And they, they had a picture of me. Uh, they even put a blurb on the front cover, Mystery Man, Jim Egan knows who built the Newport Tower. And now, if he could only get people to listen, Mr. And look, this is me in my Elizabethan costume with, uh, with an astrolabe and, and standing in the west window of the tower. What you don't see is I'm on the tippy top of a ladder about to fall on the inside. And they put this, summarized it all in two sentences, uh, two nice pages. Not one person came. 
Hey, I saw your article. Tell me about it. Not one. Anyway, uh, I, I, I was also have been called the Stone Temple Pilot. I love that's that one's my favorite. <laughs> But what I want to talk to you today is that they, they put up this exhibit, the Newport Historical Society. Once we made this, this rabble rousing about the tower and this, all this other, the Templar people are always calling the, the director of it. She's like, I'm going to settle this once and for all. I'm going to put up an exhibit and we're going to explain exactly what it is. Well, uh, this exhibit at the, at the uh, Museum of Newport History in Washington Square, right downtown on the second floor of, of this building, is. Uh, it's got, uh, and really nice, she did put a paragraph for each one of the Templars, the Chinese, the Portuguese, and Jim Egan is down there someplace, <laughs> and, and then, uh, and then, but here's really what it is, it's, a, it's just a windmill burnt by the first governor, and we know that because in 1950 they did an excavation and they found this, they found this millstone, and they also found uh, um, uh, down at the base of the trench, uh, they, they, down where they were excavating, they found a rock, and they lifted the rock up, and underneath was a heel print. And there it is right there. <laughs> they made a mold of it, right? And that's it right there. And they're like, yeah, definitely colonial heel print. I'm like, hey, you know, it could have been a mole or something. It could have been anything that made a hole in it, and you're claiming. And, and so, so these two things, and then they show uh, some various things, which I'll show you. And I read this all over uh, when they put it up, and I'm like, they blew six things. This is just not historically correct. So I'm going to explain the six things is what I wanted to explain to them, but you need not listen to me, but you're nearer people. You have to. <laughs> the six ideas, assertions that uh, the first one is that they claim that's a millstone. Well, this fragment of the millstone was found during William Godfrey's archaeological exploration in the stone mill, 1949. The old stone here, you can see grooves on the surface facilitated the movement of grain during the grinding process. The presence of the stone suggests at one point the structure was a mill. I looked at it and I'm like, what are you kidding me? That's not a grinding stone. There's people granite. Uh, grinding stones are smooth and they're, and, and they're sandstone and they have different grooves on them. I'm like, that is a piece of quarry rock from the local quarry. And I'm like, well, I'm no expert, so I'll get the expert. So uh, I went to Paul Drum. He runs the Uskapog uh, White Corn Factory, and he has run a mill. His father ran a mill uh, in the middle, middle of Rhode Island where they make uh, white corn for Johnny Cakes. And, and he got a geology friend uh, uh, that he went to URI with. And, uh, and they came over and examined it up on the second floor in front of the librarian of the Newport Historical Society. There were actually three pieces. They only showed one. We got to look at all of them. And the guy looks at it, and he goes, don't, those aren't grooves. This isn't the right kind of stock. This one's. So I said to him, look, let's just bottom line this. On a scale of 1 to 100, is it, uh, is it a, a, a grindstone millstone, or, uh, you know, a, a 100, or is it not zero? They both gave it a zero. <laughs> he said, no, this isn't even close. It doesn't even look like a grindstone. The librarian heard him. I said, look, did you hear that? He goes, yeah, I heard it. He didn't care. They didn't change the exhibit or anything. Anyway, this is what... Uh, this is what a grindstone looks like. Uh, you see these grooves are, are rectangular. These come out at, at a certain angle, and, and, um, and they're uh, squared off channels that are about one inch uh, wide. Uh, but this one here just had these, uh, these drill marks. I'm like, that's a drill mark from, from the local quarry to split the rocks. I mean, uh, what, what, what is going on? And the type of rock that it is is the same one that's used in hundreds of foundations around Newport. The quarry is in Newport, Ballard, Ballard Quarry. It's in the artillery company, in, in walls and foundations. It's in the armory. It's all built with this local stone. I'm like, that's all this is. Uh, and and, and, and uh, besides, be before the year 1700, all grindstones in America came from uh, either England or France. They didn't have the right stone here, uh, the right way to fix the stones. They later were able to, to make granite stones and such, but that was only 1800s when they, when they did stuff. So the second claim they make is that it's, it's very similar to the Chesterton windmill in, um, in, in, in England. And so here's the, the comparison picture. And there is kind of a similarity. This has eight uh, circular pillars, however, and this has six pillars only, uh, but there's a huge difference. In other words, this one here is just mortar, and these things are all sort of pasted together. This 
is ashlar. This is uh, huge stones, big blocks of stone, and, and six of them. Look, it's so big, they're even leaning this up. You wouldn't be leaning something up against the Newport Tower. They'd chase you out of town. But this is all uh, squared off stones. That is structurally much more sound than, than the Newport Tower, uh, which only has uh, you know, mortared stuff together. And secondly, uh, if you go there and, and want, look at the plaque, they tell you that originally there was a central timber structure where stacks of grain were hoisted to the upper floor. And they even have drawn this, this replica of it here of what it used to look like. So all the internal workings were on the inside. This was merely done on the outside. It was designed by Indigo Jones, the greatest architect in all of, uh, uh, all of England at the time. And so they're trying to say some colonial merchant guy was able to reproduce this because he saw it when he was, uh, when he was 19 years old. Well, they also claim that Benedict Arnold came from Leamington, Warwickshire, which is the town where this, where this uh, windmill is, uh, the Chesterton windmill is in, uh, right next door, uh, Leamington, Warwickshire. Um, but that's totally untrue. It's been known for like over 100 years that Benedict Arnold came from Leamington in Somerset. They're 100, year, 100 miles apart. And Elizabethan, in, in colonial times around then, uh, only the rich people had horses. And so he would have had to sit on a donkey for like two or three days and go up there and come back. And he was 19 years old, he, he was in school and he had his, his father's farm, he was taking care of him. Like, he didn't go up there to see some, some, some thing on some guy's pro private land. The third, fourth thing is here that the Danish scientists say that it was built in the, in the 1660s. It, around, uh, in the 1990s, the Danish scientists came over and tested the, the tower. They wanted to test the mortar in the tower to see if it was built by the Vikings, because they had heard it was a Viking tower. Well, you can't test uh, an, uh, an inorganic material like mortar. Uh, so what they did was they drilled in about six inches, uh, about uh, I think eight times uh, in, in the tower, and, and took out samples and, 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 and were able to test the oxygen molecules that were trapped deep inside of the tower. And uh, when they came back with the results, the New York Times sent a correspondent up to Toro Park and they had a big, uh, big thing, and this was in 1993, and she wrote an article about it in 1993 uh, entitled, uh, Tower Bur Built by Vikings? Bubbles Burst a Theory. At a news conference held at the tower, the Dane Jorgen Siemensen announced the panel's conclusion that it was probably built sometime between Columbus's first trip to America in 1492 and the Pilgrim's Landing in 1620, which means it's got nothing to do with Benedict Arnold's windmill, which is 1667. And then uh, uh, further on in the article, he says, the scientific evidence brings us to the conclusion that someone built this tower before Rhode Island was settled by the British in 1634. Well, uh, a year later, the guy, this guy went back to, back, back to Scandinavia, and he gave the data to a statistician. And uh, the statistician, this is the original data, the raw ages that they got uh, varied from 1840 all the, way, all the way down to 1490. Now these dates have a deviation of plus or minus 75 years, but, um, but still that's quite a spread uh, you know, to say, that, oh yeah, we definitely know what's going on. So the statistician says, well, and normally in statistics you can throw out the, the, the highest ones, throw out the lowest ones, and you average the ones in the middle, and he says, uh, yeah, it was built, we, uh, we estimate now that it was built in 1665. So this guy in 93 said 34, and then four years later he said the same data, oh no, we think it's 1665. And then he came back in 2010, delivered a lecture at the Historical Society, and he said, you know, we think now it was built by Peter Harrison in the 1700s. The guy's got three different centuries, centuries, so to me that is not really scientifically conclusive evidence. The fifth thing that they list at the Historical Society is that they show the Benedict Arnold's will, where he says, my stone bill windmill, and there it is. God damn it, that's it. That's the conclusive evidence right there, stone bill windmill. Well, it says here, Historical Society, um, collection photostat. I'm not sure what that means, but it's a picture of, of, of a will. Well, I looked at that will on the, on, on the wall there at the Historical Society, and I said, that's not the will. I used to be in Providence, and I would go to the, uh, the, uh, the John Carter Brown Library, and I've seen the original will. This is the original will, and, and he says, my stone-built windmill, yes, but around it he puts these five asterisks. These are the only asterisks in the entire 12-page will, and, uh, and they don't refer to anything in the margin. Back then, an asterisk meant I'm making an omission or kind of changing something here. And so uh, 
uh, my Stoneville windmill, he had a reason why he wanted to lie. I don't know if you know this, that sometimes politicians shade the truth. They used to, not much anymore, but it was an old thing, right? <laughs> anyway, here's a comparison between the two where you can see that this, the guy who copied this in the 1800s, he left out the asterisk. He's like, man, those aren't important. And they don't really refer to anything. This is a date, this is the word the, this is the word being, this is a bit buried, this is coin. They don't refer to anything at all. Uh, and, uh, and you can see that the, even the handwriting is, is totally different. Uh, it's spelled a little bit differently, windmill. I'm like, they claim that this is the original one right here, and I'll explain why he would shade the truth. Well, the reason is the Gilbert family and the D family and the Peckham family, the financiers and the guys put it all together, they were still living in London. Uh, they found out that the building that their grandparents had built, oh, the building's still there? Grandpa gave us the deed to that. They'd go to the king and, and they'd say, hey, look, there's the deed, there's the book, that's Landis Arch. Those guys got to get off that island right now. So Benedict Arnold, he kind of like, he's like, no, we're not going to mention that. And if anybody in, in town questions about the tower, you haven't talked to me. He was the toughest guy in town. You didn't mess with him. So, so this all kind of gets covered up. And, 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 uh, and that's why he, he calls it my stone-built windmill. Now, when he died in 1678, uh, uh, he left the windmill, he left the mill, what he calls the mill in, in this instance, the tower, to the youngest of his nine children, a girl, free love her name was. Isn't that a cool 60s name? Well, she was only 16 years old, and he, she had, uh, there were 10 people in the family, actually nine, one died. And so, uh, why didn't he leave this to the oldest son? This was the days of primogeniture, where you, where you left things to the eldest son. Well, the reason is, he wanted her to marry well, and he arranged for her, before he died, to get married to his friend Herbert Pelham, who was the head of the United Colonies, which was a big organization of Massachusetts, Connecticut, and, and, and Plymouth uh, that, that negotiated with the Indians. And they, they, Benedict was friends because Benedict was the translator. Benedict was the only guy, besides Roger Williams, who could uh, speak the native Algonquin tongue. And so the, state, the, the, the Algonquin, Canonicus and Mayantanomi, they saw him as a giant, there's almost a, a, an English sachem. Anyway, uh, he arranged to have his daughter married the son, Edward Pelham. Edward Pelham had just graduated from Harvard University, and he was the man in New England with the highest peerage. You know what that means? Royal blood. Benedict Arnold got his family married into royal blood in one generation. That might even, it doesn't mean anything to us Americans, but the British people, royal blood is like, whoa, man, that is the deal. Anyway, uh, before he died, uh, just before he died, eight di days before he died, he wrote a codicil to his will in which he, he amended a few things. The will was done in December. This was done a few months later. And he was so well respected by the time, when he, when he wrote the will, will in December, uh, he was on his deathbed in February and they re-elected him governor because he was the one that could speak to the Indians and this was during the, uh, the King Philip's War at the time. And so uh, they re-elected him governor but he, he wrote a codicil on, uh, on, uh, on the summer solstice of, of, of 1678 and died eight days later. So this is the last time he signed his name. Anyone know what that means? The, the, the summer solstice of 1678? It's exactly 100 years from when Sir Humphrey Gilbert received his letters patent rights to North America. Not just the same year, the same day. To me, that Benedict is gi giving us the clue, the last thing he did. He said, I'm going to live until I get that day out. And it, he's telling us that he knew all about this colonization effort. He knew about the tower. He knew all about the whole thing. And that he was a continuation of this Elizabethan uh, exploration that started in, in the 1500s, continued into the, into the 1600s. And so uh, he, he, that was the last thing he did. The sixth thing that I object to at the Historical Society is that they claim that William Godfrey, who did the excavation from Harvard in 1950, uh, said the tower was built as a windmill. Well, William Godfrey, here he is here. He's just a young guy. He was a PhD candidate. And uh, here he is sorting through some of the rocks that he found. They put it at the, the top floor of a barn in 1950. And then he wrote a report for the American Antiquities, and it was published in 1952. The picture shows that this is a rather peculiar anachronistic tower. It was a summer house or a folly, a comfortable retreat or a lookout. He doesn't say it's a windmill. In fact, he says there's no way it could be a windmill. And he had studies like, there's no way this could be a windmill. 
But yet, um, the historical society said that he said he did. Now, I'll explain that a little bit later. Godfrey also did an illustration in which he shows, this is a Thames Street, across the street is Bowen's Wharf. Benedict Arnold's house here was right along Thames Street. And then the, his burial place is up here, and there is the tower way up on the top of his property. And this is the picture. Godfrey drew this picture for, for his book, for his presentation, and look, if that was a windmill, he would have put windmill, he would have put blades on it. He would have put the, the blades. He didn't. He's like, no, this is a summer house of some old guy, uh, and, and that's what it is. The tower, but this is Godfrey does say this, and I will admit, uh, the, the tower must have been converted uh, to windmill later on for grinding corn based on two things. One, the fragments of the millstone, and two, the, the will of Edward Pelham in 1741. Well, the fragments of the millstone, I already showed you, that is garbage, throw that thing right out. And Edward Pelham was his son-in-law. And so when he died, he's like, well, I really shouldn't say who built the will. I'll just say what, what, what my father-in-law said, that it's a stone built windmill. But it was only one generation. Why would he call it old? if his father had built it as a windmill. So it was old because he, he knew that it was built Elizabethan times too. They all kind of knew. And so uh, there had been two famous books written about it. One was Philip Ainsworth Means, 1942. Penhallow calls this the Bible of uh, tower, tower stories. And it is a huge book, it's, it's an inch thick. And uh, he calls it the most unwindmill-like structure I have ever seen. He's like, he didn't say it was a windmill either. They all like look at it and like, that's not a windmill, that's not a windmill. Only people who do are the people of rose-colored glasses in the historical society, sorry. They just, they're stuck on that. And so the second point is that Rhode Island is important, and it's important Rhode Island history in the 1700s. Uh, there were five major cities in the United States. Boston, Newport, New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston. These are all pretty big places today compared to Newport. Uh, but it, Newport was one of them, and because the mercantile trade was, was so hot, and, uh, and in 1764, this is 12 years before 1776, the breakout of the American Revolution, uh, the, uh, the, the, to, to object to the Sugar Act, Newporters, uh, uh, they, 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 they put set cannon fire on the British ships that came to collect the, the taxes. Boom, they blew them right out of the water. This is, uh, this is one of the things that precipitated the war, but it was, uh, as I said, 12 years before. These people were bold in Newport. They're like, no, you don't give us nothing. If we want if we want to privateer, if we want to pirateer, none of your business. And we don't, we, you know, and they were smuggling, uh, they're part of the triangular trade that brought the slaves and the rum and the whole thing. And they're like, hey, don't mess with us. Well, so the British are like, okay. Well, we're just going to occupy you then, because you got the best port all in, in the East Coast. It's in between Boston and New York. So they invaded Newport and occupied for three years. And they trashed the place. They lived in all the fancy houses. Half the population left. They, uh, the troops lived in the churches, and they burned down the pews for firewood. And, 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 and the rich people that lived in the big houses, they would burn down the house next door for firewood. They burned down every tree that was on the island, trashed the place. Uh, but when they finally left after the, after the, uh, the, the Battle of Rhode Island, they had stored their gunpowder in the tower and they lit it. Boom! Boom. <laughs> Blew the top off of it. And so uh, that's why it only has a small top today. Well, after the Revolutionary War, 12 of the states signed on uh, the United States Constitution. But Rhode Island said, we're not going to sign that because you didn't say anything about freedom of speech. And freedom of speech is why we fought this, re this battle right here. And so uh, Washington was president for a year and a half before they signed on the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments uh, that, that gave freedom of speech and freedom of religion. And when they added the 10 amendments, then Rhode Island signed on. And only then did we become the United States. 13 colonies, 12 of them wasn't enough. They won a Rhode Island. Washington was so happy, he got on a horse with Jefferson and rode up to, uh, to Newport and, and gave a presentation at the, uh, uh, at the, uh, at the um, synagogue uh, saying, yes, we, 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 uh, we acknowledge that this should be freedom for all. In the 1800s, 
In 1855, uh, the tower uh, was the centerpiece of this beautiful park, who I claim was designed by Calvert Vox, one of the greatest landscape architects in America, who also designed Central Park. And it had uh, 20, uh, 23 separate islands of grass in it. And it was a promenading park where you would come and socialize and meet other people. There was actually a fence around it. So you came in, and this is, this is where you did. This is um, uh, where my museum is right now. And, uh, you see, this is some the many, many old pictures from the, the 1800s, and in the background, you'll see this beautiful hotel, the Ocean House Hotel, which had uh, um, uh, 250 rooms. It was a beautiful uh, to, uh, uh, hotel with Greek columns in front of it. This is right across from my, my building. I can't even believe it. And it took up the whole lot, which is now the Elks Club, in, uh, but it has a different building because that burned down in 1900. And, and the tower was the main tourist attraction in Newport in the 1800s. The, those mansions, they weren't even built. The cliff walk, that wasn't even built. They didn't have a big sailing business down there. This is what people came to see. They would walk up the hill, stay at these fancy hotels. It was on uh, dishware. It was on cups. It was on clothing. It was on postcards. Uh, the Harper's Bazaar magazine, we all did r reports on it. In the 1900s, in 1929, they uh, had a contest to design the first flag uh, for Newport. And uh, this fellow John Smith won with the design of the tower in, in, in a laurel wreath with underneath it says, Amor Vincent Omnia, love conquers all, which was the slogan of the first settlers on the island. And then uh, in 1930, uh, they had the last of, of four uh, America's Cup races that were entered by Sir Thomas Lipton, the Lipton tea man from England. England was challenging uh, the America. And America won four times in a row uh, over the course of two decades when they had this. But he was such a good sport, even though he lost over $10 million doing this, this thing. They had a party for him on Bellevue Avenue at one of the fancy mansions, and they gave him a sterling silver replica of the tower. And I tracked it down. It's in uh, it's in Glasgow, uh, um, in uh, in Scotland right now, where he, where he was from. Uh, and so uh, that's a valuable thing. In 1976, the bicentennial of America, the Queen came to visit, and here is, she is receiving from the mayor of uh, of, of Newport, uh, and there's there's her husband there, uh, the the city flag, which I claim was built by Queen Elizabeth first. I look at this, I'm like, whoa, is that irony or what? And nobody knows except for me. <laughs> Anyways, nobody gets the joke. Anyway, uh, the tower, the, the art for that, that flag uh, was lost in, in World War II, 50s and 60s. They didn't use the flag, it lost. And I tracked it down. I found where the guy's house was. I found his neighbor. He says, oh, you got to talk to the lady in Rehoboth. And then you got to talk to the daughter here. And then you got to talk to the son. And it was in a basement in Florida. And so I scanned it. And then I made it a freeware for anybody to use. And now this flag's flying all over Newport. Uh, so, uh, but it's... Kind of advertises my museum too, <laughs> but uh, that was the religion one. So third thing, modern science is useful for exploring history. In 1953, Farrington Daniels discovered OSL. Opera, uh, OSL. Um, uh, he was the pioneer of it. He he uh, he was using it for determining um, uh, clay, uh, the age of clay. Uh, and you guys are familiar with this. I don't have to go into it. Basically, you can determine when quartz or feldspar was last exposed to sunlight. There are over eight. There are 18 labs in the United States dedicated to it, and, and the ones that we're affiliated with uh, are, are uh, this uh, state university, the SUNY one, uh, the one in, 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 in Washington, and the Geological Survey, which I'll explain in a second. So um, uh, 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 a great NERA member left $100,000, and we do these archaeological research. As you know, and over the past five years, we've done 24 different sites all around New England. Uh, the leader of our team, Dr. James Feathers, uh, he's a geochronologist and the director of the OSL lab in University of Washington. Well, you know, University of Washington? Oh, you mean a state school? No. University of Washington is the fifth largest research and development school in the nation after John Hopkins, the University of California. Look, it's before Harvard and Stanford. This is a place that they really do this study. See, he, I'm very, I'm very impressed with him and what he does. And when they were doing uh, 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 Jefferson's Monticello, who do they call in? They call him James Feathers, and he flew in with his feathers and, and, and handled the whole thing. He just does an amazing job. Uh, the second person we had working on our team is Shannon Mayen, the research geologist at the, at the U.S. Geological Survey in Denver, Colorado. And uh, their logo is Science for a Changing World. 
the U.S. Geological is the sole scientific agency for the Department of the Interior. The Department of the Interior manages one fifth of all the lands in our nation, all this, the national parks, all the lands. And, and this is their their scientific agency. She is in charge of the lab that does the OSL testing. She's at the uh, the, the Federal Center in Denver, where there's 6,000 employees. I mean, this isn't messing around. This is big time. So uh, she wrote this letter uh, 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 of support to us as she addressed it to, to Harvey. And, and I've been here for 35 years, I was director of the lab for 25 years. You know I have a soft spot for New England archaeology. And we've already done a bunch of work with, with Nira and the whole thing. The third member of our team is uh, Dr. Maureen Fronin from uh, SUNY at the, at the lab down there, and, and where they just uh, opened up a couple of years ago. And you can read about OSL on the web, just Google it, and it says it's a uh, well-established, absolute dating technique. It's used all over the world. I mean, they use it more in France and China than we even do here in America, but 18 labs is pretty big. And so we made this testing proposal in 2020, and we presented it to the Rhode Island Historical Preservation Society, as well as the Rhode Island Historical Society, who had to approve it. And uh, well, uh, they sent it back to the Historical Society, and Historical Society said, no way, for three reasons. First off, you want to do coring, and you could damage an artifact. Coring means a two-inch drill, as opposed to doing uh, you know, a four-by-four four big archaeological excavation. Well, Feathers had recommended that because uh, all of, the, all of the, the dirt we're going to inspecting is all fill anyways. It's not like there's anything. As he says, and you're less likely to damage anything. But they do have a point. You could damage something. The second thing they objected to is they said, uh, it doesn't matter. All the dirt within the fence around there, it was all disturbed in 1950 by Godfrey. And I'm like, well, that ain't right. They had never studied the men. The third thing they said is, we don't believe in the efficacy of OSL. I'm like, oh, man, get with it. Read the books. So, uh, so they rejected it, and we, we, we put our tail between our legs and came back the next year with a proposal of 30 pages that, uh, that really explained the whole thing. And our, our proposal now, instead of coring, was to do, instead of four by four test pits, which digs up a lot of dirt, do the minimal that we can. So these are test pits that we've, we're recommending that are only one foot by two feet wide four of them, and we wanted to dig them in places where Godfrey hadn't dug, and, and, to, and te go test at one foot, two foot, three foot, four foot, so a total of 16 samples. Now, you might say, well, one foot by two foot, that's not very big. How are you going to get down four feet? Well, I said, that's a pretty good challenge. Why don't we test it? So I went out to Harvey's farm one day last summer and with all of the implements, and we laid out a, 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 a board that had a hole in it, one foot by two foot, and we started digging. And we were able to get in. I mean, I had to lift Harvey out by his legs the last time. <laughs> we were able to get all the way down with tools and dig the whole thing excavated. We took it all out down to four feet, made it in a big pile, and then put it all back. <laughs> Just to say, yeah, we can do this. Uh, but it's a lot less uh, stuff to move, uh, especially because it all has to be done in the dark <laughs> because you have to have a tent around you. And we had plans for a tent, the whole thing. In other words, we chose places where Godfrey had not digging. If you go to his report, which the historical site has never read his report, obviously, he says, uh, I've less, left places undone for future archaeologists. I intentionally left these places so people can do testing. And it's not like we're going to use up a lot of it. Uh, the, he used about, uh, uh, he examined about 50% of excavated it, and then so there's 50 left. We're going to, you know, disturb about 1%. It's not a big deal. Uh, and so uh, we also wrote these three uh, notebooks that had background information on all of these things. We had letters of support from from uh, from Feathers and all of our uh, all of our, our workers, including Vance, who is going to do the uh, the the, uh, the local uh, field work on it. And this is the letter that it she didn't even send a letter to me. She sent it to Feathers. Uh, the head of the Historical Society is my position as the director of the Historical Society. No more test pits or any excavation should be done around the stone mill. In Newport, my opinion, every excavator since Godfrey has been chasing a particular dream or playing with a new toy or both. I will argue that I do not think the origin date of the mill is actually much in question in spite of the many pieces of information and speculation that have been sent to me over the years, <laughs> including me, museum. Uh, 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 you know, th three blocks away that's been there for 12 years with 10,000 and she's never been. Anyway, uh, I let everybody have their own idea about the tower, but I don't really like if you stand in people's way. Um, so uh, this is the Historical Society statement. You can see they do a lot of great things. They, they run uh, several of the buildings, they get publications, conferences, the whole thing, but there's one word you won't see in here. That's the word research. 
Well, that's the word that's in New England Antiquities Research. That's in the USGS, the research arm. Of the, that's in the fifth largest research of the whole thing. This is what we do, so they should, you know, lighten up a little bit. And I found when I studied in business school, if you don't invest 10 to 20 percent of your in, of your business budget in uh, in uh, in in research, you're probably going to be out of business in the next in the next few years. So, so. Uh, uh, these are the three points that I tried to make in this, ex 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 this, this discussion here. And uh, uh, we've done some preliminary research. We've done a ground penetrating radar so we can, can examine what's in the ground, four feet underneath the ground. This is some of the results of it. Uh, various levels are different colors here. Uh, and this was done by a company up in, in, uh, in New Hampshire. And then we've done a LIDAR t uh, of, the, of the tower done by uh, Tom Elmore in Connecticut, did a fabulous job. He and his son there took a 1,000 pictures. And we're able to map this out on, 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 uh, on a chart uh, and, and, and uh, put it all with, with, it, with the proper GPS. Now, there's four big societies in Newport, preservation, restoration, historical society, the Redwood Library. But none of them own the tower. They don't study it. They're not concerned with the tower. The tower is run by the Parks Department of Newport. And Scott Wheeler does an excellent job. Uh, and, and, but I help him a lot. And, and But he said, uh, Jim, I have to defer to the historical society because we do a lot of you know co co coordination with them. And I can't cross with them. So I'm like, oh, OK. So uh, this is about uh, 20 years ago. I took pictures of the top of the tower. I had permission to go up with a ladder. And I'm like, that top of the tower, you're getting seepage in there. That's not good. And that led to uh, a huge repair job that they did on the tower, $40,000. And then um, the fence was all rusted over. And I was part of a committee that, that raised uh, another uh, $20,000 and took the whole fence down, stripped it, and fixed the whole thing up again. And and we also uh, paid for this, uh, the illumination of the tower at night. When you go there at night now, it's all beautifully illuminated. And, uh, uh, and so uh, what we're not asking about is for the, get the city to approve the archaeology. That's what RIPEC does. If we get through the city, we still have to go to the people up at the Rhode Island Historical Preservation Society, which is one of the, the 50... Uh, the 50 states each has one. All we're asking for the city is 16 soda cans of dirt. Is that that much? Look, a bag of dirt costs four bucks. This is two bucks. Hey, look, let's do a, let's do a, a cost-benefit analysis here. OK, $2, the cost, historical value, priceless. <laughs> talk about talk about uh, uh, convincing evidence right there. So it doesn't matter who you think it was, colonists, the Elizabethans, Portuguese, the Vikings, the Templars, the Chinese, or anyone else. Uh, what's important is that no matter who it is, wouldn't you want the forensic team back in the lab to examine all of the evidence? Uh, please. So uh, are you into scientific progress or status quo? Now, in 1990, uh, around the end of 1990, uh, they, they, they chose one site from each state State of the Union, U-Haul company, and they put it on the side of their trucks. And the one that they stole, they stole, they, they used for Rhode Island was the tower. And, uh, and so you'll see it, they still use it today. What's important is that uh, Rhode Islanders should be interested in Rhode Island history for their own sake, but also for the sake of the other 48 states, because this is one of the original third colonies, is where a lot of uh, a lot of America started. And so <clears throat> at the very end, Gil, uh, Godfrey acknowledges the Newporters who supported him. Look, the people who helped him out. <laughs> historical Society, Historical Society, Preservation Society. And he says, the main person who helped me was the chairman of the Parks Commission. In other words, he got all of the stuff through for him in the city. Those are the guys that are fighting against me. And, and he says, uh, uh, Jerry Sullivan, uh, with the Parks Commission, whose unfailing interest and ready made and helped me over the they're trying to help me out. So I asked people, are you still curious about... America's oldest secret, oh, you can't cut it, it's cut off in the ball, which is what they call it on the TV show. America's oldest secret, there you go. <laughs> and that's the end of my show, I wanted to thank you. Oh, I want to tell you one more thing before we go, is that uh, what happened was, uh, I just heard a couple of weeks ago that the Historical Society uh, director is leaving January 1st, and we're getting a new one, and I met her at an event last Thursday, and she was very nice, a nice young woman who went to college in Salve Regina, which is in Newport, and studied archaeology. Oh, yeah! So, it's, it's a rabbit in the hair, but we're going to get there. Thank you very much for listening.
an amazing tour de force, unbelievable.